Okay, well, here's part number four of the repainting or painting this locomotive or a locomotive. Um, there it is. All it's all in its uh, glory. It um, runs with green, aka dark green locomotive enamel glory. Um, it came out just absolutely perfect. I'm quite proud of the way it came out. It uh, and I and I owe. I, I got to mention one guy here, my dear friend Mike McCotter in Suffolk, Virginia, who encouraged me to use a certain kind of paints and things, and that really helped. But uh, you can see it here. So thank you, Mike. You can see it here. Perfect condition, perfect shape. Uh, you could, I don't know if you can see the difference in the camera between the black and this is the black and this is the green. Now, side rods, all room redone. Here's one here, and I'll show you how I did it in a minute. Here's the one for the other side. There you can see, that's, that's called electroless nickel. And I think it looks pretty good. And uh, I this one, I, I don't know if you can see it there, right in here. Uh, it was peeling there, and I sanded it a little bit, and just touched it up. I didn't feel like doing the whole thing. Now, quite honestly, I think the next time around, I might decide to do electro plating, not electroless. So uh, the paint came out great. Smoke box color is absolutely perfect, right on. The number board uh, came out pretty good. I got to put a little clear on it. The numbers back here. I got to do a little touch up on it, uh, just you know here and there, just touch touch it up a little bit on the other side as well. I got the windows done, and I would have liked to have redone the cab, but the heck, can't do everything, you know. And uh, I got to put the pump on now. The pump, it's a whole other story. This is a Mose pump, okay? So we said, don't mention people's name. Why not? Mose pump. Mo made this pump. Uh, friend down in Florida, Paul Levy, had two of these. Never could get them to work. They kind of worked. They didn't work. They worked. They didn't work. And I'm having the same problem. It's, it's all in the slide valve here. Now, you see on the top here, it's three, it, 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 um, um, three holes, and the center one is the exhaust, the other two are one for each side. And the way it works is it's not compound. It's just straight pumping, straight. It's not compound. And the big problem I had with it was the valve here. Now the valve is right here. It, 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 it's magnetic, so it's, it's going to rust. And I don't think it's stainless. It looked like it might be, but I got a piece of stainless here, half inch square. And later on today, I'm going to mill a new one out of stainless. And that, of course, fits inside this chamber here. Fits in here like this. And it, you know, slides. Back and forth. And it works pretty good, uh, except that that valve is terrible. And I got to remake a new one, a little bit better quality. And uh, put it back together and put it back on here and hope that it's going to work. And if it don't work, well, I, one time I got it to work a couple of times pretty good. And I got up to 160 pounds of air which is pretty good, and I haven't been able to, to achieve that since, so we'll see what happens. But anyhow, now I'm going to go over to where I did the plating and explain a little bit about that and uh, tell you what I think, what I don't think, uh, what the good, good parts about it and what the bad parts about it. So we'll see you over in the other section over here. Okay, now we're going to talk about nickel plating, electroless. That means no electricity. And um, this is how I did it, barely. And uh, I can see what's happening on the bottom of this pan here. Uh, okay. Originally, well, you got you got an issue with 
with the, uh, let me get the side rod here, it's right here. Actually, it's the main rod. Uh, you got an issue with length. This is long. Now, if you get a big pan to fit this, you're going to waste all this uh, solution. And the solution costs, this cost, this size right here costs $29. And you need one ounce of that and three ounces of this, which is $47 a quart. And I use most of that here, and then of course you got to use distilled water. All right, well, the thing is, it fit perfectly in this, but this is plastic. And you have to heat the solution to 195 to 200 degrees for it to activate. And um, uh, so, originally, I had a, a heater like this. It went down inside. Now, this is an aquarium heater, but I'm not thinking aquarium heater. Look, the other one looked like an aquarium heater, but there was a big difference. This one, I never thought of this. Fish can't live in 190 degree water. There's no such thing. So, uh, this only goes up to 80 degrees, which is like tropical fish stuff. So, that's out. And um, so, I had a good result to the hot plate. And I bought a uh, Pryrex plan, which was big, and it took a lot of the solution, but it was glass and it would work. But here's what happened. When I put it on here, the heat was uneven because it got two different burners, two different speed, they call it here, high speed, low speed. But what happened is that one heated the, faster than the other and it broke the pan a million little pieces. I had solution all over the floor. All right, well, now I was pretty discouraged, and I'm thinking, well, I'll go get it done somewhere. And No, no, I'm not going to give up. So what I wound up doing was um, thinking, wait a minute. I use spackle pans. Well, maybe they make a metal spackle pan. Now, this is a, wi a, this is a planter, a window planter. You put that in a window, and you put your flowers in there, and then you can take them out and burn them and put them back, whatever. And uh, I got that at the dollar store a long time ago, but this is a box that you use, or a pan that you use for spackling. Now, believe it or not, they have a 24-inch spackle pan. It's a stainless steel. It's heliarc welded on the ends, which you want. Now, they do make one that's folded and just stake punched or uh, spot welded, but they're going to leak. And you can't put silicone in it, maybe high High temperature silicone, I, I don't know. Uh, you don't want it to leak. So anyhow, uh, I said, wait a minute. I can get, uh, so I go to the Home Depot, and of course the Home Depot, they got uh, people work there that, uh, well, we want to get into it. That, uh, they didn't have the, the size, but they had a 14 and a 12. So I said, well, okay. I'll buy the 14 and the 12, or the two 12s or whatever, and cut them. And weld them together, which I did do. I welded them together. But now it's conductive. So you can't really use it because it's going to plate. So I powder coated it in there. But the powder coat didn't stick all the way. And I'm looking at the bottom here now. And it's got uh, plating on it. It's, it's, it plated it on the bottom, of the, the bottom of the pan here. Now you say, well, what the heck are all these little plastic balls? Well, when it starts to heat up, those balls keep the, the uh, heat in, and it keeps the vapor from dissipating into the atmosphere, and uh, it helps. Now, it took, I don't know, it took maybe a half an hour to plate that, and it came out pretty good. Now, the next time I do it, I might even use a real electric, electric plating and uh, see, you know, look a little bit more into it. I really didn't expect to have to do it on here. But when I was power washing it, some of the plating came off, so I had to fix it. And I knew this, I knew this worked, so I tried it again. But um, I'm thinking if I go back to this, possibly I can get a silicone heater element to go in here and make some sort of a control for it, and that would be the best way to do it, uh, something non-conductive. 
This here plate actually plated at the bottom of this tank because some of the pot, uh, you can see it here, some of the, the, uh, the powder coat just came right off. Uh, won't stick too good to the <coughs> uh, stainless steel. Now maybe if I sandblast at the inside, give it a little more of a tooth, that possibly could have worked. But uh, and the other thing is almost essential is to have a thermometer here. This is like a, I got this at the bed, bath, and beyond. Now when you go in there, you say, where's the beyond area? Because that's, you know, bed, bath, and kitchen. And uh, that they had it there. I don't know. It was like five bucks for that, and that worked out pretty good to keep the temperature even. And th th this worked. This this actually worked. Now, I don't want to show you how it worked and everything because, look, okay, maybe I'm wrong or whatever. If I'm wearing a mask, the gloves, of the blah blah boo, you know. So I'm not showing how I actually did it, but believe me, it worked. You want to get the stuff? It's called the company's called Caswell Industries, and you can look them up on the internet. <coughs> they're in New York, and uh, you got to get the parts, the two different parts, and you got to have a book. Where the heck's my book? <coughs> I'm fighting a cold. Believe it or not, summertime, I got a cold. Uh, they have the book here as well, all about all the plating, all different plating. You can buy the book separate. You don't have to buy the kit. Just buy the chemicals. And you go to town. Now, so I was able to get it done. It's going to suffice. And maybe another time I'll do it a little bit better. But I wanted to get it completed. And I was thinking, even seriously considering powder coating them with a chrome like powder. We used it on Dan's motorcycle. And it looked good, but it still looked like it was painted. No matter how you look at it. This has got a little bit of a shine to it. Now, it might have worked. I, don't, I have no idea. Uh, be worth a try. Oh, by the way, if you're going to go to the pan route here like this, the metal pan, you want to make something as big as the biggest rod you think you're ever going to use. And unfortunately, the, the, this rod here is 18 inches long and the Mikado is 19. So I made this 20. So I have some room. But, um, and so you're not using as much fluid this way. And it worked out pretty good. And I got it done. I, that was the main thing. I got it done. And uh, the engine now is uh, a couple of little minor things, and it's ready to go. So uh, that's about it uh, on this uh, re reworking, repainting, and re reconditioning the K4. It's uh, running pretty good. I, a couple of things I could have done, maybe redone the bushings and some of the other things that uh, maybe in the future, Instead of using bronze bushings, I might use, uh, I definitely will make hardened crank pins. Hardened and ground crank pins. You might say that's extreme, but uh, they wear. They actually wear. And the brass don't, brass don't wear, the pin, crank pins wear, and you can't replace them. You have to take the engine apart to do it. Uh, so uh, that's the way I would go with it. Bronze bushings on a hardened crank pin. Uh, the pins for all the valve gear would be uh, the bushings and, well, the bushings would probably be bronze, but the pins would definitely be hard and uh, because they wear out. I've noticed that they're all kind of egg-shaped, worn, and everything. The engine runs perfectly square, um, and I hope I got the eccentric crank back in the right spot. It should be. So I, uh, I mark it well, and, and I got a set screw, and... I had it backwards at first. What the heck's going on here? And then I had it backwards. Anyway, I fixed it. Uh, and you can't mix them up side to side. Uh, but the K4 is just looking great. Now I got to do the tender. And uh, we'll go on from there. So uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed the, uh, the series on uh, repainting. And uh, we'll see you again on the next video. And thanks for watching.